Hey there, thanks for tuning into Duck Bricks. I'm Chris, and this is the biggest Lego Ninjago dragon yet. It is the Source Dragon of Motion. Coming out this summer, this has been a set I have been anticipating for months now, and I will say this set absolutely delivers because this, in my opinion, might actually unseat Lloyd's legendary dragon for me as the best Lego Ninjago dragon we've ever gotten because this thing is absolutely gargantuan. Just look at the sheer scale of this source dragon. And obviously we know the source dragons are the biggest dragons in Ninjago lore. So it totally makes sense it's this big, but seeing the amount of articulation on the wings, on the legs, even on the tail, it is easily one of the most exciting new sets coming out this summer. And I can't wait to showcase it for all of you. It's the source dragon of motion and it actually does introduce some pretty interesting lore ramifications as well. Why is Lord Roz controlling it atop a throne on its back? We'll have to wait and see for the summer season to actually release. But as of right now, let's jump in to the Source Dragon of Motion and check out what is in my opinion one of the best Ninjago dragons ever made. Prepare to align yourself with the motion of the universe for this is the biggest Ninjago dragon ever the Source Dragon of Motion. Coming in at $150, this is gonna come out on June 1st everywhere in the world except for the US, where it will come out on August 1st. And to date, this is, in my opinion, not just the biggest, but arguably the best Ninjago Dragon ever made. And this is coming from, in the same exact wave, getting unequivocally the best Ninjago mech, we are also getting what I think is one of the best, if not the best Ninjago Dragon. It may top my number one favorite Ninjago Dragon, which is Lloyd's Legendary Dragon. If you watched my top 10 best Ninjago Dragons video, you know where that one sat on the list. But this, this is next level. So let's take a closer look at the Source Dragon of Motion itself. Obviously, I want to start off with the build, and then we're going to take a look at the minifigures near the end of the video, because I've already put out a dedicated minifigure-specific look, which you can check out on the channel already. Now, for $150, you pretty much get this gigantic dragon, as well as a few figures, plus the small little miniature new molded dragons in transparent orange, representing the spirits of the other Source Dragons. But obviously, what you're paying for is this gigantic dragon. And this is a very unique set in Ninjago history, where if you read the description of the set, and obviously this is without spoilers, Season 2 Part 2 is not out yet, and I have no idea how this is going to play out in the show, but we know that from the set description at least, the ninja are trying to free the Source Dragon from Lord Roz, who has somehow put it under his control by placing his evil throne atop the Source Dragon itself. And because of that, they make it very easy for you to just remove the chains and then remove the entire throne and have the entire dragon by itself to play with. But we're going to start off with just a closer look at the full dragon itself with the throne attached and just zoom in on all the things that you can do with this incredible build. So first of all, this features some of the most amount of articulation we've ever seen from any Ninjago dragon. Not only are the wings mounted on mech-style ratchet joints so you can twist them rotationally and up and down to make the wings flap, but you can also angle the wings backwards and forwards because each of the wings is mounted on a click hinge ratchet joint for the wings themselves, which is absolutely crazy. They were able to factor that level of articulation into the wings of this build. It is pretty unprecedented. The only times that we've seen stuff like that are with the Smaug Dragon from The Hobbit, and that was again a pretty much single, multiple molded set of pieces where you could actually fold the wings inwards and outwards, but honestly, I don't even know if that really counts because that is kind of just its own pre-molded thing. But aside from that, we haven't really seen that in any other type of Ninjago dragon. Sure, we did get a creator dragon here and there that might have had some more articulation, but nothing as stable and as playable as this. And that is something that really excites me because one of my favorite things to do with Lego dragons is, of course, flap the wings. Who doesn't like flapping the wings of Lego dragons? And it always is frustrating if, for certain Ninjago dragons, sometimes the wings are just fixed and you kind of rotate them back and forth. Sometimes there is a function behind flapping them, but then that removes a lot of articulation. Or 
Other times you just have a ton of blades and you don't really get to see a semblance of wings. But here, these are proper wings, and I think the only thing that would have made them better is if they used a fabric element. I will always prefer fabric over vinyl when it comes to dragon wing pieces, but I actually can kind of excuse it for this one because the wings are made out of fire, and it kind of makes sense that they would be somewhat transparent, something you can't really accomplish with fabric wings. And so, this is the one time where I actually do kind of feel that vinyl was the way to go because you can feel the transparency. It feels that the wings are made out of flames themselves, which is super, super cool. Now, in addition to the articulation of the wings, you can also move the legs back and forth. No knees, unfortunately, and while they are set up on ratchet joints that theoretically would have allowed you to splay them out, they are permanently fixed in one position. And the reason for that is because this dragon is so heavy that they decided not to give it articulation to allow the legs to splay out because then that would just make it pretty much impossible to stand and I think that was actually a good decision. Usually when LEGO limits the articulation on things, I am always in the camp that okay they could have been a little bit more free with the way they do things, it could have been a little bit less cautious, but no, I think this was absolutely the right choice. It is a gargantuan beast, and having this in hand, you really feel the heft and the weight of the dragon, and it makes sense that they were worried about it collapsing, and that's why the legs are pretty much just fixed at a certain angle, and you can only bend them back and forth. The same goes for the back legs back here, which you can see rotating back and forth like so, and of course each of the claws does actually allow you to rotate them based on the bionicle style ball and socket joint, which is quite nice, but also doesn't really give you a ton of extra articulation because again the legs are pretty much fixed. Now one thing that is very very cool is that you also have four different points of articulation in the body, where the body can move in this snake-like reptilian motion, and to accomplish that, they've actually gone ahead and recolored those click joints that we got all the way back in Exoforce for the Striking Venom. We've gotten recolors of them in red and dark red, which is super, super cool. I'm very glad they did that. However, I do have to say that I do think it is a bit of a miss that they did not utilize the recently recolored dark red mech style of articulation joints, which we literally just got in the Dungeons & Dragons LEGO Idea set, for this set. And I feel like it was just right there, they could have totally used it and it would have fit in the color scheme even more, but for whatever reason, they chose not to use it. If I had to guess, the development team of that set maybe just didn't communicate to the folks making this set that they had that recolor available, or maybe they figured that since they already were using recolored ratchet joints, they decided to keep the existing mech ones in black and dark gray because of confusion during the build process. But whatever it is, whatever those pieces do appear on Pick a Brick, you bet I'll be purchasing them and upgrading this because it's not a big deal, and if those pieces didn't exist, I wouldn't even be complaining but the pieces literally exist in dark red, and they chose not to use it, so that is just something I do want to call out. Moving on from that though, there's even more articulation, because the tail itself is mounted on one of those mech style ratchet joints, meaning you can rotate it in every single direction and kind of move it all the way upside down in a 360 degree pose, and then the actual joints of the tail are fixed on Mixel style ball joints. So there's a ton of mini ball joints that allow you to twist the tail back and forth, and they've also recolored the Ninjago crystallized blade in dark red and transparent orange as a dual color mix, which is super cool. We're also seeing it in the Thor Ragnarok Surter set, which we're getting later this year in August, but I think it is a phenomenal recolor of the blade piece. If I had to say one thing, the box art makes it look really great where the dark red is on the bottom, and the trans orange is on the top and it feels very clean that way and in actuality it's just kind of mostly transparent orange with a little bit of dark red coloration mixed in it's not bad just the rendering just definitely doesn't really capture the actuality of the piece itself i don't think that's false advertising i think it's very hard for a render to capture what a dual molded piece would actually look like but it's just something i do want to call out moving on from that we're still on articulation because you can actually move the neck rotationally, which is very, very cool. It is also fixed, so while it is mounted on one of those mech joints where you would think you could move it up and down, you can just only move the neck on one click joint, and that's also because the head is so heavy, but then the rest of the head is mounted on a ball joint. So as you can see, the head itself can be rotated and played with freely, although unfortunately, 
Because of the weight of the head, the ball joint on the secondary neck piece does keep on drooping down. I'm very glad they integrated some pieces to prevent it from drooping down all the way, but that does limit the posability a little bit, especially if you don't have your hand on it, because there is just no way that you're going to be keeping the head of this dragon up. And then finally we get to the actual dragon head itself, which is mounted on a ball joint, can look side to side, up and down, and rotate, because it is just freely moving on a ball joint, and of course you can open and close the jaw as well. Now with the throne actually removed, you get a lot more points of articulation, especially when posing around the wings. And one of my favorite things to do with this model is just to go absolutely crazy with the wings, trying to bend them backwards and see what that looks like, kind of like a walking alongside the ground pose and then splaying the wings forwards and then upwards, kind of acting as like a fiery crest, almost like a Dilophosaurus or something like that. And then you can bend the wings outwards for flight. There's just so much stuff that you can actually do with the model. It is really, really impressive. The amount of play value that you could get out of the articulation on the wings. And now, I kind of want every LEGO Dragon to feature articulation like this. I get that this is the biggest one, and it makes sense that they would definitely limit some of the articulation in future models, especially if they make smaller dragons for Ninjago. But this, this is just so, so cool. And I just love the amount of articulation that we've been able to get out of the wings here, making it such a fun play feature of the actual set. This set, much like the mech, made me sit down and just play with it by flapping the wings, by angling them back and forth, by just going absolutely crazy with the way the wings were set up. It was so, so much fun. Now, I do want to move away from the articulation and talk a little bit more about the aesthetics of the model itself, because I feel like that is an equally important part, if not even more important, with making a successful dragon, how does the color scheme come across? And I'm happy to report that the color scheme is incredibly consistent throughout the entire model. The underbelly of the model is pretty much all gold, almost like it's using golden armor on the underside, but they've pretty much constrained the gold to just that amount on the underside as well as on the sides of the legs, making it look like the back legs have knee pads and the front legs have kind of side armor. And I think that's a really smart usage of gold. It is very easy for an amount of gold on a set to feel overwhelming, to make it feel like there's too, almost too much gold going on. But I feel like this is pretty much the perfect amount, where the gold is specifically used as highlight colors, making it feel like it is regal, wearing armor. The horns, of course, utilizing the new climber hook piece is maybe a controversial choice. Some people like it, some people don't. I actually really like it. It makes it look like it is this great horned creature with these gigantic blades sticking out of the head. I think that's a really cool look, but of course you can change it if you don't like it. And then of course you can get to the upper part of the body itself. The sides are made with dark red, bringing in that kind of more realistic or quote unquote realistic color for a fantasy animal, of course, of the scales. And then you go to the bright red on the top where it feels like this is literally lit on fire where as you cascade down to the back of the model, you actually have these transparent orange elements scattered seemingly randomly throughout the build, making it feel like there's fire literally rippling across the back as the scales on the back of the dragon. It is the perfect color transition from gold to dark red to bright red to transparent orange that really makes the model come alive. And I feel like that is another incredibly strong aspect of this dragon. Just how imaginative it is with the color scheme, with the way everything comes together, it just feels incredibly polished. Now there are a couple of points where they did have to make some compromises. Instead of using pearl gold in some places, they did have to use this nougat color. And you can kind of see that most obviously on the bottom of the dragon where they just used a nougat colored element instead of pearl gold to represent the, the base of the dragon, which is covered up with some of the crystallized golden scale elements. But it is just something I do wanna point out is that obviously they're not going to recolor every single piece in pearl gold and for some pieces it doesn't even make sense to structurally recolor them so they worked with what they could and i am pretty happy with the overall look and it is definitely something that you don't even notice until you zoom in so that's just something minor i did want to point out but overall color scheme is looking really good and then all of that is in direct contrast to the evil looking throne on the back of this dragon now this throne almost feels like a miniature version of the Wolf Mask Shadow Dojo. And I wouldn't be surprised, some folks have actually posited this theory that since the Source Dragons are so massive in the show, they are some of the biggest beasts we've ever seen in Ninjago, 
this may just be a representation of the entire Shadow Dojo on the back of the dragon. I feel like that would be so crazy. That would go so hard. And I don't know whether it's a throne or meant to represent a mini version of the Shadow Dojo. I do think it is a really cool addition. And they've managed to get a lot of cross in terms of the height and the scale of this build while keeping it constrained to pretty much just a few pieces. And the way they've done that is by utilizing a lot of Technic, where typically I would be against this much Technic kind of just being used for structural detail and not being covered up in studs or tiles, but here it actually works because these sharp angles and the very mechanical and almost smelted nature of the Technic pieces are in direct contrast to the organic curves and the very smooth pieces around the dragon and it feels like something foreign, something that should not belong on top of the dragon, which is a really unique concept for them to actually come across for a dragon like this. Of course, the throne itself is absolutely covered in all sorts of spikes. You have the Chima spikes being used to great effect. You have all sorts of different spike elements being used to exaggerate the detailing of the throne. And I think that just makes it look even cooler with the blue flames on the wolf claws being used on the front. It's just a really cool design. And I also love just how easily it does pop off simply lifting up two of the pieces on there that allow it to attach on with clips, and you can remove the entire thing, leaving just a plain brown 2x2 saddle-like element, which you can use to sit any of the ninja on top of the dragon, which I think is a really nice touch, because this type of thing, being so large but also coming off as easily as it does, is a very impressive work of engineering, and I definitely want to commend the designer, Li Chi Wing, who you can check out on Instagram for putting together what is, in my opinion, one of the best dragon sets ever made. Now, of course, not everything is perfect with the dragon, and I do feel like one of my major complaints about the dragon is the bottom jaw. They have done some really great dragons in the past utilizing some of these very pieces, but I'm just honestly not the biggest fan of this particular bottom jaw piece. I get that it is the largest bottom jaw that I think they produce right now, and it makes sense with the shaping and the scale of the build, but I don't know, just having the plain pearl bottom jaw definitely does feel a little bit like they could have just added in a bit more detail. Lloyd's Legendary Dragon, for example, utilized a really nice molded bottom jaw that actually interfaces with the top one, but the teeth were actually colored white. And I feel like that really could have been done here where if they had that bottom jaw piece be used, sure it would have looked a little bit smaller and maybe the head would have looked too small on this dragon, but then they could have colored the teeth white, which is something they can do adding even more onto the details because right now it's nice but it definitely feels like it could be improved by just having those teeth be white in color. Overall though, I am finding it very hard to come up with complaints for this set. I guess if you are really crazy and keep on flapping the wings, if you go really rough with it, it does tend to kind of rip the model apart sometimes, and that is only under very, very heavy play. Like, you can see I got some footage of it just exploding, and typically the entire model is very tightly held together. There are some very, very impressive studs on the side techniques being used to hold everything together, but if you're being super rough with it, if you're having those wings going absolutely crazy, yeah, it will just tend to kind of rip the joints out and completely combust the body, which is a good thing because it's Lego, so you can always put it together, but it definitely could have been maybe a little bit more stable in the way that everything does come together, but then that would have come with compromises to the aesthetics and to the price of the part count. So overall, I do think that the right compromises were made. I am finding very few negative things to say about the set because it is just so good. It is honestly the pinnacle of Ninjago Dragons and... I think this is going to be hard to top. But now I think it's time that we wrap up the review and talk about the price. So for $150, you have a really phenomenal price per part ratio. This is absolutely incredible value, especially compared to the last big dragon that we got from Ninjago, which was, of course, the Golden Ultra Dragon, which was even more expensive than this or around the same price, but way less pieces. This is an absolute steal compared to that. And I appreciate the value of this model. 150 feels incredibly fair for this. When I first got it in hand, I thought this was going to be 200 and I, I kid you not, I was like, okay, oh man, Ninjago's going to charge us 200 for this. I'm ready. I'm not happy about that, but I am. But then the price came out, and I was like, there's no way this is 150 That's absolutely crazy. And I will absolutely roast a Lego set if it deserves it, if I feel like it's overpriced. 
an upcoming review coming up. The Ninja Team Combo Vehicles from this very wave. Ridiculous pricing. Do not buy that at $90. So bad. Why would they ever do that? So I will, I'm not afraid to roast the prices of a set if I feel like it deserves it. But this, this genuinely feels like it is worth it. $150. And you actually get a pretty good lineup of minifigures with it as well. And let's take some time now to quickly look at the minifigures. Again, I did have that dedicated minifigure video, so we're not going to be inspecting every single aspect of each of the characters, but I just want to call out, we get Lord Roz, Jordana, and a Wolf Mask Warrior it, representing the Villains faction. And on the heroes, we actually got a pretty good team. We get Kai, Aaron, and Wildfire. So Kai and Wildfire make sense because they're both kind of fire-oriented. And Aaron being one of the younger ninjas totally makes sense to also include in this set. And I think it's a really good lineup. There are very intentional choices made in what minifigures to include in what sets made throughout this entire wave of Ninjago, which is very apparent when you look at the entire distribution of the wave, where you have pretty much two copies of almost every single character. And if you buy two sets... You can get all of them, which I think is really great. Ninjago hasn't done that in a while. But because of that, we do get some really nice, even distribution between villains and heroes. The Lord Roz minifigure is beautiful. I love the design of it. The printing on the arms is absolutely exquisite. And I just really am a huge fan of the way they were able to pull off the detail on this minifigure. Jordana wearing the Shatter Spin armor is honestly a little bit mixed. I am not the biggest fan of the Shatter Spin armor piece. I definitely feel like it could have been very much benefiting from a dual mold to really bring out the blue claws and the gray armor and maybe the red orb in the, in the chest. But overall, it's all right. It's a little weird how they have you put the armor on backwards compared to what we see in the show, but it's not a big deal. You can always just flip it around. And I do like that Jordana does have exclusive legs and torso this time, where typically she did just share it with Cinder for the March Waves. Here she's actually getting a brand new gunmetal gray outfit, which I feel like works really well. What doesn't work well for me, honestly, are the Wolf Mask Warriors, and I've seen a lot of people go back and forth on this online. I think the purple and the red is... Just a little bit too garish of a color scheme for me. I think in concept art, it probably looked really cool. But in order to pull it off, I feel like the bright red should have been dark red. And, or maybe they should have just included purple highlights and then an overall black mask. I don't know. There's just something about it that I just feel like is a bit of a drip downgrade. From the original Wolf Mask Warriors back in March, the dark blue and the azure looked so good, and I was a big fan of that color scheme, and their powered up form being purple and red, the bright purple and bright red just clashes a little bit too much for me. Although I will say, the big claw attachment elements are very cool, very nice to get these in transparent red with the red claw pieces on the ends. I think that is a very nice add-on piece to have the energy claws on the back. And I do like the integration of gunmetal, but I just feel like this could have used a few more iterations in concept development, in testing the color scheme, to really make it look as menacing and as cool as they should, because right now it's just a little bit too wacky colorful for my taste. Moving on to the ninja though, it is nice that we actually get both Kai and Eren with the new shoulder piece attachment included. That is not the case for every minifigure in this series, but one thing they did that was nice was that, I don't know if this was just random, if I got lucky, or if this is something they're doing, but if you buy all the sets in the wave, you get the exact amount of armor pieces to armor up the minifigures that we get in the other sets that are missing the armors, so I don't know. It's just kind of weird that they just made that work out pretty perfectly, but that's nice. This set did include an extra armor piece, so you can actually use that for the other characters, and Wildfire is probably the least interesting because we did already get her exactly in this outfit for the March sets, but it is nice that we are still seeing this design being used, and I do like the new mold being used for her hairpiece, and it's cool that she's getting some more character of her own. That's all for the figures. Also nice that we got six copies, six, pretty generous, of the brand new Source Dragon Spirit Mold. Very curious to see how this is going to be represented in the show. If they are different colors, like if they're transparent green and yellow and transparent black for all the different elements of the Source Dragons, I feel like I would have wished that these came in all the different colors, but if they are just all orange and maybe these are all just tied to the Source Dragon of Motion being trans-orange, I will take that back and say, you know what, totally great, and I feel like it's just gluttony to ask for, oh, well, why didn't LEGO recolor this piece in six different colors for this set that's already great value? You know, I'll take it. We already got six of them. It's not a big deal, and I do really like how we did get them as little individual pieces, and with that... We've pretty much summed up my thoughts on this phenomenal Ninjago Dragon. 
one of the best they have ever done in my opinion, one of the greatest Ninjago Dragons, I will have to really sit down and think whether it's recency bias or whether I really do feel like this is the best Ninjago Dragon. And I can't wait to see what else comes out in the future, because so far, this is the biggest. But as LEGO has said in the marketing many times, it's the biggest for now. Which makes me think that they are very much chugging towards an even bigger Source Dragon set coming out next year. Fingers crossed, I would love to see that. But that about wraps us up. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this review of the Source Dragon of Motion. Alright, so that was our look at the absolutely incredible Source Dragon of Motion which is now maybe my favorite Ninjago Dragon they've ever done. It is really hard to beat that one. I hope you enjoyed our review at an early LEGO Ninjago summer set. Let me know down in the comments below, will you be picking up this set when it releases? And thank you so much for tuning into Duck Bricks. Be sure to like and subscribe for even more LEGO news, reviews, discussion, and analyses coming your way very soon. Thanks so much, and bye for now.